Are you prepared to go back to work safely? BackToWorkSafely.org features easy-to-follow, industry-specific, science-based recommendations for limiting the spread of the coronavirus when operating a wide variety of businesses. Download your free guidelines today at BackToWorkSafely.org. All right. Well, I want to welcome everybody to this press conference that's being hosted by AIHA. My name is Larry Sloan, and I am the CEO of AIHA, the Association for Scientists and Professionals Committed to Preserving and Ensuring Occupational and environmental health and safety, both in the workplace and the community. So we have with us today several leading experts in aerosol science, occupational health, and infectious disease who are all signatories uh, to a letter that was sent to President Biden's administration requesting immediate action to address inhalation exposure to COVID-19. They are not alone. AIHA has joined with nine other leading scientific organizations to endorse recommendations for OSHA, CDC and NIOSH and other federal agencies to create specific guidelines for workers and communities related to the aerosol transmission of the virus. The joint consensus statement that I'm referring to can be found on AIHA.org. Additionally, our Back to Work Safely guidelines designed for smaller sized businesses in 27 different industry sectors are all available free of charge in both English and Spanish. They've been downloaded more than 1.25 million times, and they've been made available to governor's offices across the nation. So please visit our website, backtoworksafely.org for more information. So a bit of housekeeping before we proceed. This event is being recorded. If you do not wish to be recorded, please disconnect at this time. All attendees have been automatically muted. If you'd like to ask a question, please use either the chat or Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You can also raise your hand if you'd like to speak and we will unmute you. So with us today are several signatories of the letter and these include first, Dr. Lisa Brousseau, a certified industrial hygienist and research consultant at the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. Next, Dr. David Michaels, who served as Assistant Secretary of Labor for OSHA from 2009 through 2017 the longest serving administrator in OSHA's history. He is currently a professor of environmental and occupational health at George Washington University. Next, Dr. Donald Milton, professor of environmental health and internal medicine at the University of Maryland. Next, Dr. Lindsay Marr, the Charles B. Lunsford professor at Virginia Tech's Department of Civil Engineering. Next, Dr. Robert Shuley, professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases and Global Public Health and co-director of the Center for Innovative Phage Applications and Therapeutics at the University of California in San Diego. Next, Peg Seminario, who previously served as the Safety and Health Director at the AFL-CIO. Next, Dr. Michael Osterholm, Regents Professor and McKnight Presidential Endowed Chair in Public Health and the Director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. And finally, Dr. Kimberly Prather, who serves as the Distinguished Chair in Atmospheric Chemistry and the Director of the National Science Foundation's Center for Aerosol Impacts on Chemistry of the Environment, also at the University of California, San Diego. We also have Dr. Jose Jimenez of the University of Colorado in Boulder to assist with Spanish language press inquiries. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Don Milton, who will provide some background and a few brief remarks before we open it up for questions. Dr. Milton, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Larry, for the introduction. And thank you everyone for joining us today for this press briefing. Uh, as you've heard, I'm joined by a number of scientific and medical experts in the field of aerosol science, occupational health and infectious diseases, many of whom have researched and worked on infectious diseases for decades. And all of them have been working since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic to stop transmission of this deadly virus. On Monday, we, along with other scientific and medical experts, sent a letter to government officials leading the Biden administration's COVID-19 response, urging the CDC and other agencies to fully recognize inhalation exposure to virus carried on small particles floating in the air as a major way the SARS-CoV-2 virus spreads and to take immediate reaction to control and limit this source of exposure. Early in the pandemic, as you will all remember, 
Many, including the CDC, thought that the virus was primarily spread by large droplets from infected people coughing or sneezing directly on one another and from touching surfaces that were contaminated with the virus. But soon it became clear that many people who were infected but had no symptoms were spreading the virus simply by breathing and talking. With the virus floating away on their breath, carried through the air by small particles and being inhaled, breathed in by someone else. We saw large outbreaks where groups of people congregated and spent time together in close indoor spaces, outbreaks at choir practices, bars, restaurants, meat packing plants, and correction facilities. People were infected not only if they were in close contact within six feet, but also at further distances when they spent time indoors in closed spaces where there was not adequate ventilation. More recently, we've seen reports of people infected even with very brief exposure of three to 10 minutes. And even when everyone, both the person exhaling the virus and the people who were exposed and became infected was wearing a mask, a surgical mask even. So for months, the scientific evidence has been clear. The transmission by small particles floating in the air, technically known as aerosols, emitted by infected individuals are a major way this virus spreads. And inhaling these small particles is a major way that people are infected. The risk of inhaling virus is greatest closest to the person exhaling the virus. Defining airborne transmission as only when people inhale the virus when they're far away from the source and claiming that inhaling the virus close by is not airborne is confusing and is stymieing effective policy response. To date, CDC has failed to fully recognize this and is still minimizing this pathway of exposure. Most CDC guidelines are out of date. They still focus on the spread of the virus by large droplet spray at close range within a few feet. The CDC guidelines don't include or recommend the control measures necessary for limiting and controlling inhalation exposures. Ventilation to dilute concentration of the virus, filtration to clean the air, and respiratory protection and better quality masks to protect workers and the public from exposure. These are in addition to limiting the number of people, the time of occupancy, and physical distancing that are also all critical to preventing and limiting exposure. The failure to address and control inhalation exposure leaves the public and workers at great and much greater risk of infection. People of color, many of whom work on the front lines in essential jobs like healthcare, food processing, and transit, have the greatest exposures and have the greatest risk. They've suffered and continue to suffer the greatest impacts of this COVID pandemic. And now we're facing the emergence of new viral variants, which are more transmissible, it seems, and may even be more deadly, which makes it even more urgent to address and limit inhalation exposure. So we wrote this letter to put inhalation front and center and call immediate action to address this major route of exposure. Actions critical to protect the public and workers and particularly those vulnerable groups at greatest risk because the vaccine rollout is taking time. People will continue to be exposed and get sick and die and the virus will continue to spread and dangerous variants will continue to arise. So here are the key things that we urge. We call upon the CDC to update CDC policy and guidelines to make clear to the public that inhalation exposure through small aerosols is a principal way that the virus spreads, not droplet spray and touch. We want to see an update and strengthening of recommendations to limit and control inhalation exposures. This includes guidelines on enhanced ventilation and filtration that focus on both the quality of air and the quantity of air movement that contribute to lowering small particle concentrations in indoor spaces, including workplaces and public buildings and homes. 
We want CDC to work with OSHA to issue recommendations and requirements for the use of NIOSH approved respirators like N95 filtering face piece respirators for all healthcare workers and other workers who are at high risk of exposure, such as meat packing and poultry workers, corrections officers and transit workers. A year into this pandemic, we must provide respiratory protection to all workers who need it. We want to see CDC to adopt guidelines for face coverings for the public that comply with the new just released ASTM standard for barrier face coverings to ensure both source control and personal protection from small particle inhalation. Currently, the public has no way of knowing if the masks they're using are effective. And we call on OSHA to issue an emergency workplace standard on COVID-19 that requires an assessment of inhalation risk and adoption of controls that include enhanced ventilation, distancing, effective respiratory protection for workers in the high-risk jobs, and high-quality barrier face coverings and masks for everybody else. So we call upon the federal government finally, to use the Defense Production Act to ramp up production of respirators and high quality barrier face coverings and to provide the funding and enter into contracts for the production of this needed equipment and make it accessible to the most vulnerable and high risk workers and community members. Under President Biden's leadership, the country's moving forward to tackle this pandemic, ramping up vaccines, expanding the use of masks and addressing the disparate impacts of the virus on people of color. But to see, be really successful, we must finally recognize inhalation exposure as the primary way this virus spreads and take the needed actions to protect the public and workers from this deadly virus. So thank you. And now we'll take your questions and members of the panel uh, will try to address all of them. Thank you. Thank you. The first question goes to David Michaels, and this is coming from Kim from CNN. Carrie, excuse me, from CNN. Mark, do you want to repeat the question? Uh, yes, sir. So uh, this is, uh, it, it came in uh, a bit of a an email. So if I could summarize, uh, how, do, do you believe that, uh, so basically, again, summarizing here, the CDC responded to CNN in a letter, pushed back against the use of N95s for the general public. Uh, and, and so the essential question is, do you believe that this is uh, a win? Do you believe it's a acknowledgement that the ASTM standards may be implemented by the public? And so related questions, have you spoken with CDC, with the Biden administration? Is there any indication that ASTM consumer mask standards will be adopted widely? Well, uh, thank you uh, for that question. First, we haven't, I haven't seen that letter. I don't think any of us have, so I can't uh, respond di directly, but it's really important to note that uh, we don't say that uh, N95s are appropriate for the general public. What we're saying is that certainly for workplaces and other um, situations where people are congregated for long periods of time, uh, where there might not be enough airflow to ensure that the air is clean, uh, first, we expect who's ever in charge, the employer, to do a risk assessment and then make sure that it's understood that there could be uh, exposure to these uh, dangerous aerosols. That means that in some cases, you know, once we improve ventilation, we may still need better respiratory protection like N95s or other sort of respirators. That would be true, for example, in healthcare settings, in hospitals, in nursing homes, in um, uh, meatpacking plants, where we know that, you know, we've seen plenty of examples where people who are far away from the infected person are being, are exposed and getting sick. Uh, one way to think about this is to focus on the amount of time and the level of exposure. So if you know, we're worried, for example, about bus drivers, bus drivers, there's plenty of evidence that bus drivers have gotten sick. There's a really tragic example of the bus driver from Detroit who reported in a, a video he posted of a, a someone who came in and, and was coughing, and then he developed COVID and died. You know, that bus driver needs better protection. 
those bus drivers need better protection. And they should be wearing N95s or some other uh, respirator, appropriate respirator, because they're eight hours a day in this bus. The people who come on and off that bus can wear surgical masks to keep, or other cloth masks to keep uh, the virus out of the air, but it won't protect them the same way that bus driver is protected because that bus driver needs more protection. Here, you've been unmuted if you'd like to ask a follow-up. Yes, that would be great. Sorry, I wasn't able to speak. Um, hello, and thank you for um, allowing us to ask these important questions. Um, I wanted to follow up on uh, your letter and a statement to CNN responding um, to the letter that many of you put out. Um, the CDC pushed back against the use of N95 masks by the public, but it didn't address your call for the implementation of the newly improved ASTM consumer mask standards. Um, and I wanted to know if you believe that's a win and it could be an, it's an acknowledgement that the standards may be implemented and considered by the CDC and the administration. You know, I'll let others follow up on that. We, we don't look at this as a win or a loss. Um, you know, we think the evidence is really compelling. There's a, a large number of scientists and we're eager to work with CDC, with OSHA, with other agencies, with employers and, and public health departments around the country to apply these this evidence as well as we can. And it won't be perfect, but to make sure that everybody is as protected as possible. Have you have you been in touch with um, the CDC? Have any of you been talking to the CDC or the White House about the implementation of the ASTM standards? Has there been any sort of discussion? Um, Not sure if anyone can answer that. <laughs> I don't know if anyone wants to, I don't think we have. I mean, okay. we're all, um, if people are all shaking their heads, so it sounds like no. Okay. And it was just finally issued on Monday. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it was uh, a working work in progress until then. Okay. Thank you so much. The next question is, given your proposals, does the CDC guidance on distancing in schools still make sense? And related, is there a difference in transmission between three and six feet? Jump ball. Go for it, Don. <laughs> you know, yeah. if uh, if aerosols are if the aerosols floating through the air, uh, they they don't just stop at three feet and say, "Oops, I shouldn't go any further." <laughs> so um, certainly, you know, concentrations will be higher nearest to the source, but eventually, mm -hmm. aerosol um, spreads throughout a room. The smaller particles will diffuse and and spread and. Um, if with poor ventilation, especially, you'll have a lot of spread throughout, you know, so the room is, can be filled and three feet, six feet isn't really going to matter in the long run. I, I can chime in. Um, I have been advising um, school districts. I think many of us have. And um, my advice has been and so far been heard um, is that the distance is, is important. Um, as Lisa mentioned, it's more concentrated close to the source, but the aerosols don't stop and they build up in a room just like cigarette smoke if it's not ventilated. So I have been advising schools to um, have the kids wear, all, in addition to distance, wear masks indoors at all times. And if they can't, they have to eat. And we're in San Diego, I'm in San Diego, so they go outside because um, that's the riskiest time is taking off the mask. Um, so, you know, distance plus, you know, putting in proper mitigation you know, ventilation, filtration, you know, it's all these layers of protection um, to truly make schools safe is really, really important going forward. Mike, I'm concerned about teachers proctoring lunchtime if it's indoors, because you have one important layer of protection that is removed for people to eat. And I don't, I, I think we need to be thinking carefully about what should be done at lunchtime. Uh, in schools and, and because of the risk of inhalation exposure. But, but I think we're, we're all eager to see schools reopen and um, want to make sure that school systems and the health departments they work with and their consultants all take into account the latest scientific evidence, which in some cases means, as Kim said, in improving ventilation and filtration immediately, because those are things that can be done in many schools um, that probably have to be given a high priority. And it uh, looks like Rena Nakano has a question. Rena, you are unmuted. 
and or we have asked you to unmute. There you are. You should be able to speak now if you'd like to identify yourself and ask your question. Hi there. Uh, this is Raina Nakano from ABC San Diego. Um, so my question is, what I mean, now that you have this letter being sent, what should we do in the meantime? Um, you said that obviously N95s are not for everybody, but let's say you find one on Amazon. How do you know it's real? How do you know it's good? And also for the regular people who are just, you know, walking about doing their own thing, do you think double masking is kind of the direction that we should be going now that, you know, this whole aerosol thing is kind of in the forefront? Thank you. Part of the point of the ASTM standard is to give people information about what they're buying. And of course, it'll take a time for these uh, labeling uh, standard essentially to get out into the marketplace, but we hope that that will make a difference. And we need to be working now on coming up with how to educate people about what these things mean and what to look for. Uh, and so that is something that CDC can do. And the, the point of this double layer is you need to have a good filter and then it needs to be fitted tight on your face so that it doesn't leak very much. And uh, the, the second layer is usually something that is designed to make that first layer, if it's a good filter, work better by fitting tighter. So let's I also say I add, one, okay, go I, ahead. Let me ju just, if I could just add to that, I think one of the very important messages here is that this is an, a, a comp complex set of recommendations in that the device in of itself, whatever it might be is one thing, but we have not done a good job of educating the public in two other areas. One is about time. We somehow make it seem as if you have a device, you're protected forever at any point. And we need to continue to emphasize the distancing issue and how critical that is. So that people who may wear a face cloth covering thinking I'm protected and then go and spend eight hours in a bar where basically, you know, they spend the entire long evening, that is a very different situation uh, from what you think you might be protected from. The final piece is just however we do it. And I think this is an important message today about the kind of devices, but one must wear them correctly. We did a, just as an example, we did a survey uh, several months ago of following evening news, which we froze the frames of crowds in the evening news that was covered. And then just went through and surveyed who those who had some kind of a mask or face cloth covering on, how was it worn? In 25.6% of the time it was under their nose. You know, what I call the classic crib or the chin diaper. And again, we've not done a good job even there. So as we want to wear new and important devices, we also need to understand to make sure that we educate people how to use them, why they're effective. And I think that's, that's part of this whole message today. It's the best device with the best recommendations for how to be most safe with its use and what the, that means. So and I'd like to- if you might like to address the uh, issue of double masking. Can, can I say something? I'd like to talk about the ASTM barrier face covering standard for just a minute. So um, the barrier face covering standard is actually a, a performance standard. It has recommendations for method, it has requirements for methods for filtration efficiency, airflow resistance, and a leakage assessment. And all three of those elements are important. So, um, what they're recommending is a, a, a worst case filter efficiency kind of test that's a lot like the test that's used for NIOSH and airflow resistance test that's a lot like used by NIOSH for respirators. That's the recommendation for testing barrier face coverings. It's appropriate because it will help you separate good filters from bad filters in terms of their capture of particles as well as how hard they are to breathe through. One of the problems with double masking and the push for double masking is there's no assessment of breathing resistance. And what we do know is that as you add more layers, one on top of the other of cloth materials, it becomes harder and harder to breathe through them. Respirators are not made out of cloth materials for that exact reason. Filtering face piece respirators are made out of a different kind of material that has low breathing resistance and high filtration efficiency. But really, 
I, I wish that we would not be drawn so much into the masking discussion. The purpose of this letter was not to discuss masks. It was not to discuss what's a better mask or what's a, it really was to call the attention to the fact that workers are not being offered the kind of protection they need. And until CDC recognizes that from the perspective of inhalation, we will never have the opportunity to protect workers who are really the key to success at getting the economy back safely. And until we protect all essential workers with the full range of controls, which includes respirators and maybe good, better face coverings for those who are at not the highest risk, we will not be successful in stopping this pandemic. Take Seminario here, if I could just uh, follow up on that. Uh, again, as Lisa said, um, I mean, masks are important. They're really important. But for those of us who work in occupational health, the first thing you learn is there's a hierarchy of controls. And what you want to do is you want to control the exposure in the environment first, you know, and that's through source control. And uh, it's through, that's one of the reasons why people are told to stay home so that they're, you know, you're removing the hazard. Uh, it's why we're trying to limit occupancy. And it's why we really need to improve ventilation in these workplaces and looking at airflow. Uh, and, you know, and we look, need to look at filtration as well. Physical distancing is really important as well. And so there's a whole range of control measures that we need to look at. When we talk about respiratory hazards, inhalation hazards, the first thing we really need to look at is to lower the concentration before we get to thinking about the respirators and the mask. Sometimes that's a lot harder, uh, but it's really the most important thing we can do. And it really is the critical issue that CDC has not addressed, uh, they need to address. And it's the critical issue that we need OSHA to address as well in the standard. Because you know it's no fun to have to wear a mask eight hours a day. No fun to wear a respirator. It's no fun to wear, you know, a mask for, you know, an hour a day. And so we need to really look at uh, lowering, preventing the exposure in the workplace by lowering the concentration of the virus in the air. Okay, and so uh, we've got a lot of great questions coming in. Uh, moving down the line, I'm going to uh, unmute Alexander Tin. Uh, and Hi. We are, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, sir. Yeah, it's Alex Tin from CBS. Thanks for taking the time for my question. If you will permit one more question on masking. I'm curious, you know, you cite other countries that are actively recommending that all of their general public, you know, or most of them use an N95 respirator or an equivalent. Can you walk me through why you're stopping short of that recommendation here? I mean, what is different about France and Germany than the United States? Um, I can just uh, speak at least my views on that. Uh, you know, Germany in particular, and it was Austria, Bavaria first, and then Germany uh, that took the lead on this. Um, you know, they are, um, shall we say, have a much better um, organization in terms of regulation uh, and control measures, right? They've ramped up their production already. I mean, they focused on this issue really early on, the need for better mass, the need for production here. And so they are in a place to recommend, and in some cases require, these better masks and even a level of protection of an N95 because they have the equipment, right? They can do that. Here in the United States, we're not in that place. We still have, uh, you know, there's more supply available. It's not making it now to the people who need it. It's not making it to, healthcare workers are still reusing N95s for days, weeks on end, uh, these are, are, are respirators that really should not be used for that long. Uh, and so, and then we have lots of workers who are not being provided um, respiratory protection when they say they should be. Support workers in hospitals we know are at very high risk. Most of them are wearing procedure masks and they've got a very high rate of infection in a lot of cases. And so we want to focus on getting the protection to those that are at the highest risk first. First of all, we need to do that. Not so different than getting the vaccines to those who are at highest risk first when you have a limited supply. We ever get to the place where we have, you know, enough of the equipment, uh, we can provide it, but let's get it to the people who really need it 
those that are, are the most exposed, those who are suffering the most, so we can protect them now. Okay, and next we have Emily Kopp. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Oops, there we are. Hey, this is Emily Kopp with Roll Call. Um, thank you for taking my question. As far as implications for workplaces, um, is it fair to say that if guidance isn't updated that employers could continue to invest in plastic shields rather than better ventilation and cloth masks rather than respirators? And what are the implications of that? And then if I, if I could ask two questions, I'm also wondering if someone could touch on sort of the historical reasons why um, the CDC has been slow to recognize the importance of aerosols. I, mean, I can take the first of these. Um, you know, I, it's, I always find it very disheartening when I see pictures of poultry factories where the workers are still right next to each other, but there's just a piece of plastic, in, you know, hanging in the air between, between the ones who are side by side, but not even uh, the ones who are across the way from each other. That's just not going to work. We understand from you know, aerosol science and uh, the aerodynamics of these viruses that people are being exposed um, even with these plastic sheets. Um, you know, look, they're not big investments, though I think there are probably some places which have invested more, but we have to think about differently. And we have to think about, as Peg said, the hierarchy of controls. And how do you make sure that the virus, as much as possible, the virus is not in the air there are some things are obvious when people are sick, they need to stay home when they've been exposed, they need to be stay, they need to stay home and they need to get a uh, sick leave. So they, they don't feel pressure to come in. But if they are, if people are coming in and they're potentially infectious, we have to make sure there's as much fresh air as possible, which means ventilation and filtration. And that's where the investment obviously should go. Uh, you know, we expect OSHA to be putting out a uh, emergency temporary standard sometime soon. They're going through, uh, the analyses right now to determine uh, what can be in that and to make sure it's all it's all justifiable. Um, and we, I think, by not having the CDC recognize the importance of aerosol transmission, it will set back OSHA and set back employers from doing the right thing, because OSHA is going to need to point to the CDC guidelines and say this is this is what you need to do. And currently, so many CDC guidelines are out of date. They're left over from the Trump administration when we know there was political interference and putting together guidance that really is not effective uh, for protecting workers. So I, the way we see this right now is that um, we're asking CDC to, to change their guidelines and to update them and to get rid of really the politicized um, information in there and incorporate this evidence. And that will then be very useful to OSHA and to employers around the country to make sure workers are safe. And then just to make that final point that you've heard before, for many people in the country, going to work is their primary location of exposure. There are people who are very careful and they, they when they go leave work, they go right home and they're there with their families, but they spend eight or more hours a day in places where they are potentially exposed to large numbers of people. And if we're going to stop this epidemic, especially with the new variants coming, we have to make sure workplaces are safe. So one thing follows the other. And in some ways, the very important first step is to recognize and for the CDC to recognize aerosol transmission. Okay, and then I wonder if Lindsay would like to weigh in on that as well. Uh, regarding the second question, why do why is there a kind of a reluctance to uh, acknowledge airborne transmission or address inhalation exposure. Um, I, I can speak not directly about CDC, but kind of a reluctance among the medical community and infectious disease communities in general. So I've been studying this for a little over 10 years, not nearly as long as, as others here. But when I first entered it, uh, what was surprising to me is that information that's embedded in the, the canon, in the textbooks, is uh, just physically wrong. It's like saying, oh, the apple's not gonna fall from the tree in terms of how droplets and aerosols behave and how people might be exposed. So there's this longstanding historical bias, I would say built into the system where there's a higher bar of proof for airborne transmission uh, by inhalation of aerosols compared to other routes. Um, part of that's due to, you know, back when they were defining these, these routes of transmission, there was no way to detect aerosols. Part of it's due to the fact that when you are in these close contact situations, you can't separate out uh, different types of transmission easily. 
Um, so the only way to do that, really to prove that something was airborne was to uh, show that transmission was occurring at a distance. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's not occurring via aerosols at close distances. Um, and then there was, uh, there was in the 50s, there, were, there was a period when uh, someone who was heading the CDC was a strong advocate of hand washing and wanted to emphasize that um, and downplay the, the potential role of aerosols. Right now I'd ask you know, Chip Robert Schooley to weigh in if you would. Yeah, change is slow to happen uh, a lot of times, and there has been for a long time this uh, taboo about using the word airborne uh, that conjures up things from Hollywood and uh, from uh, movies that uh, scare the hell out of people. And when airborne is used, people think about uh, going to a football game and having somebody in the opposite 50 yard line drop dead in front of you. That's not what we're talking about here. Airborne means something is in the air. That's what we're talking about here is trying to reduce the chance that uh, something gets out uh, into the air. And if it's out, that you inhale it. Uh, that's all we're talking about here. But uh, people have been reluctant to use that word uh, because uh, of what it conjures up. There also was some reluctance when uh, there was perception there was not enough uh, protective uh, uh, equipment around uh, to say that people needed to protect themselves because of, there was a perceived need. There was a need to make sure that uh, hospitals were safe. Uh, and uh, that um, led to, uh, I think, a slow turnaround uh, on this uh, as this went about. The WHO, I think, was worried about uh, resource limited settings, not being able to afford, uh, people not being able to afford face coverage, not making one people to feel bad about not being able to do that. We saw the same thing for years with any retroviral drugs. Oh yeah, well, that drug is good enough for, their, uh, for uh, Africa because it's uh, not that expensive. Uh, you need to set standards based on science, and then it becomes an engineering and economics problem rather than setting policy based on what you think can be uh, can be achieved. And, and that's where I think a lot of the misinformation and misdirections occurred over this issue of um, of aerosol and airborne transmission. Thank you. And any other questions that folks would like to ask the attendees, uh, then please be sure to raise your hand or submit a question in the chat. I wonder if any of the other panelists would like to weigh in on this meaty topic, or we can move on to the next question if you like. Okay, so uh, one of the questions that came in is, how can we support the message about inhalation being the main route of exposure? Who uh, should be using this message. Then a related question is, the public health approach to protect people from environmental tobacco smoke was successful in ways that the fight against SARS-CoV-2 has not been. Why? So there's a couple of great questions for the panel. I think one thing that people that uh, CDC can do is to clarify its information, its web pages, where it talks about how does COVID-19 spread. The, that web page focuses mainly on droplets and close contact. There is maybe a subtle way that they explain that uh, microscopic droplets or aerosols can be inhaled, but it's really buried in there. The thing, the message that comes across from that is uh, droplets, which I think makes people think of things they can see. And the, the other message that comes across is close contact. And it says that uh, airborne transmission can only happen in certain special situations. I'll just add on 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 that in that um, you know the recommendations right now, even though they haven't been updated and they're confusing, and on different pages they say different things. Um, people are trying to use them. Schools are trying to use them. Businesses are trying to use them. And when I ask, you know, why do you think this or why aren't you using this? Their answer is, we are following the CDC guidelines, and they are not adequate right now. And so that's not okay. If we really want to end this pandemic, if we really want to get back in business, there is a way there, but we have to acknowledge that this virus is spreading through the air or we are just going to keep yo-yoing back and forth. And so we, in the, you know, people are going to look to CDC for that guidance. And so we desperately need them to give the straight truth the public can take it. They're ready for it. They appreciate the truth that, you know, knowledge is power. And if they can just, you know, be told what's happening, they can make better choices. But there's still way too much confusion in the public about how this virus is getting around. 
Building on some of the questions that have come in, I wonder if one of the, the unstated questions is, why is there opposition to the inhalation exposure? So why hasn't your, your letter already, uh, why hasn't CDC already made those changes? Why do some groups uh, maybe oppose what you're proposing? Well, I think that it's some of the historical context that uh, you just heard from uh, Drs. Marr and Schooley, that um, th there's change comes slowly. There's a lot of inertia in people's thinking. Uh, and if you've been reading textbooks all your life and uh, that, that have you know, conveyed the wrong impression about what's an aerosol and how this works, it's very hard to overcome that, uh, and, and it takes a lot of time and persuasion. If I could just add to that, I think, you know, the other thing that we've seen over time, when you're talking about the workplace, uh, which is the area that, you know, I have spent my, uh, uh, my time working in, um, you're talking about a, a setting with respect to control measures that, that are regulated by OSHA, so you're in a regulatory environment and a lot of employers and particularly a lot of hospitals and healthcare employers over the years, you know, they don't like the government telling them what to do. They think, you know, particularly in healthcare, that the prof as professionals, they have the best judgment on this. And so we've always had a tension uh, between sort of the occupational health uh, experts um, who have been seeking for, you know, the basic controls you use to control exposures and some of the healthcare professionals. And as uh, Don and, um, and Lindsay and Chip has pointed out, there's been a long established, uh, um, I would say orthodoxy in the infection control community that really does go back to you know, the three foot rule, now we're into the six foot rule uh, and to you know, droplets being, you know, it, uh, uh, being you know, the main way that, uh, that the virus is uh, spread. Um, but to be quite you know, clear about it, there are ways, and as Kim and others pointed out to control uh, um, airborne exposures and protect people from inhalation. I mean, we know how to do it. That's what we do in industrial <laughs> hygiene. Um, but the fact of the matter is they can be more expensive. And a lot, if you think about it, a lot of the control measures that have come out have really focused on individual behavior, uh, such as wash your hands and keep your distance, which are important. I'm not downplaying them. But when you get into then looking at what require uh, changes uh, in the workplace environment and the public environment, uh, it becomes a little bit more difficult. And so there's pushback to that as well. Friendly reminder that if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand or use the chat or Q&A function. Uh, Jose, I wonder if you might be able to make that request for any Spanish listeners, please. Yeah, I'm certainly I'm certainly happy to answer any questions in Spanish. But there is a separate press conference tomorrow for Spanish-speaking journalists, so we can also defer there. I, I wanted to add a point on, on what has been said very briefly, which is that uh, regarding the CDC recommendations, that there is the what they tell us to do, and there is a why do we have to do it. And as we have been discussing, what they are telling us to do is imperfect and needs to be improved with these recommendations about respirators or the ASTM standard. But I think it's especially important to tell people why these things are needed. And I think that has been especially poor from CDC and really especially bad from WHO, that they are not telling us why. Christian Drosten, who's a high-level expert in Germany, a virologist, he, he said many times, we have to tell people the virus goes through the air and it goes like smoke. And once they understand that, they can really protect themselves a lot better. And a lot of the resistance to these measures drops because otherwise it seems arbitrary. Now I have to wear this, now I have to do that, now I have to do that, but I don't understand why. And people really have trouble with that. Okay, thank you. We had a question come in, um, another question about schools, perhaps not surprisingly. So the question is, the CDC guidance for schools recommends that students eat in classrooms or outside. In many areas of the country, outside eating is not possible, especially in cold months. What specific types of protections would be needed in classrooms where there will be students not wearing masks? This would apply not only to meal and snack times, but to classrooms where there may be students who are, who are unable to wear masks. I think there's a couple of levels, and I'm sure there are others here who want to speak to this. Uh, but uh, one thing is uh, filtration. 
uh, ventilation, uh, you know, when it's cold and below freezing outside, opening windows and doors to bring ventilation through is not going to be very popular. But uh, filtration can make a difference. Uh, and also the paying attention to the direction of airflow so you don't have a lot of people downwind of each other uh, to the extent that you can do that. It's difficult to engineer in a classroom. And then finally, um, there's a, a, a method of controlling uh, inhalation exposures, airborne infections, uh, called uh, UV air disinfection. And in fact, this morning I was on a meeting with a charter school here in College Park, Maryland, that is installing upper room UV with ceiling fans in the lunchroom, specifically to deal with this problem, to be able to rapidly kill, uh, inactivate viruses in the air uh, during this one most activity where children cannot wear uh, face coverings while they eat. Kim, if you would. Yeah, I'll just um, add on. I agree with everything. Filtration is a big one, you know, that you can just, but also reducing the number of people that are in that room that are eating at the same time. So you'll want to space them out, keep the numbers as low as you possibly can, put them, you know, in different in different rooms, um, but filtration is definitely gonna be your friend in that situation, but also as I say, low numbers is really, really important as well. Thank you, and Carrie has another question. Please go ahead, Carrie. Hi, it's Carrie from CNN again. Um, I To switch gears a little bit, I just kind of was curious, you know, um, mass guidance has changed several times in the past year. And, you know, sometimes with, starting with disagreements between experts such as yourself and you know the position of the federal government and you've spoken to you know the need to educate american consumers and the public on the best ways to protect themselves do you think they're still listening i mean is that a concern that they've kind of tuned out this back and forth at this point i think they're still listening because we're seeing more and more people wearing masks uh, that's happening kind of on a monthly basis when you look at it um, not happening everywhere in the country and to get back to um, Professor Jimenez's point, a lot of it's because they don't know why they should be doing it. They think it's some uh, some governmental uh, proclamation. If they understood, uh, if we were better communicating why this is important, it would not be something you'd be having to tell people to do. They'd be wanting to do it. They'd be looking for masks that are effective in, in carrying it out. Uh, we need to have both clearer communications among uh, from uh, the government and from experts to the public, and the public needs to understand what the basis for these recommendations is, so they can uh, can um, uh, also become uh, a partner in doing this, rather than uh, a group of people who feel like they're being told what to do yet again. The other thing that I think confuses people is they say, well, you told us this then, now you're telling us this now. Uh, science is, uh, is a discipline in which we learn from observation and we pay attention to what we see. And if we aren't learning from what we're observing, we're not scientists. And what we've seen has happened over the last uh, number of months is we've seen uh, molecularly defined uh, transmission clusters that can't be described by droplets. We've seen other uh, observations that uh, make it very clear that the virus can be transmitted uh, uh, by aerosols uh, in an airborne fashion. Uh, and they shouldn't, be they shouldn't be dismissed as anecdotes that don't occur very much. They should be acknowledged, uh, and we need to be um, preparing for that and, and helping the, under, the public understand uh, why uh, the recommendations are evolving as we see as the science evolves. Um, and if, if I could just add, having you know run a couple of different federal agencies, it's hard to change an agency's position and direction overnight. That as science evolves, you can you look at the science, you think, what does this mean? You have to deal, there are a lot of staff, there's a lot of um, direction going in one direction. Uh, people who've held firm to their positions, they may not have been as impressed with the science that you've been. Um, and we have a transition to a new administration. So all those things are part of sort of a dynamic that's going on now. But um, I think, I speak for all of us, we have great confidence in, in some of the, the new leadership in the Biden administration and also the terrific staff in these agencies. Um, obviously, there are gonna be some people who will cling to the old science and, and not respect sort of all this new development. But I think um, this is clearly where we have to go and I'm confident we will get there soon, if not you know, tomorrow. 
you know, okay. Rena, and then we'll go to Tina. Oh, I'm sorry, Kim, did you want to add on? Just really quick. Um, one thing that kind of gets lost in the messaging, which I think is really important to say, is that, you know, I think people are very frustrated um, by sort of all the changing things that are happening. But there's, you know, if you look at the, it's mentioned, you know, countries, there are countries that never shut down. Taiwan is the one that comes to mind. Um, they just followed the recommendations right off the bat. They had seven deaths, 24 million people, um, but their economy kept going. They kept going. And we can do the same. I mean, it's like it is there are success stories all around us. And so, um, you know, we don't have to choose. The, it, but again, it, it comes back to just the messaging and having everybody buy in and work together, we have to unite to fight this virus. And so I just I just want to add that in is that I understand we all understand the public's frustration at changing messages, but um, there is hope that we can we can do this if if the messaging gets clear and the people that are supposed to be delivering the message deliver it with us. Thank you. Rena, do you have a question? Yeah, sorry, just to follow up. So if you are in a position where you are a worker, where ventilation and filtration cannot happen overnight, for example, if you are a bus driver or something like that, what can you do right at this moment before CDC standards get updated or um, filtration and ventilation can go into the bus with some new UV thing? What can that person do right now to protect themselves better? Well, I mean, I could speak to that, that it's hard for an individual to insist on change at their workplace. They can certainly try, but this is why workers have unions. And, you know, certainly the uh, transit workers union that's working, that represents bus drivers has been on the forefront working with the, the transit companies to increase ventilation, to figure out how they could put in filtration and to address those problems. And they really have to be addressed across the workplace or in some cases, multiple workplaces like bus drivers. Um, it's very tough for that individual. It's hard to say, what can you do? I mean, you can wear your own mask, you can try to do things to protect yourself, but that's not ever gonna be the answer. This has to be done on a societal level from the individual workplace to the whole industry, to the whole country. And this is where the government has to step in and make sure this all happens. Uh, if I could just follow up on that, just to relate, I mean, I mean, earlier in the pandemic, when people were, you know, um, trying to figure out how to protect themselves, a, a lot of workers were trying to bring masks into the workplace, and they were told they couldn't wear them. Um, some of them were fired, right, for trying to wear better protection uh, in healthcare for wearing your own N95. I mean, so there was a lot of a lot of pushback. And so what we need is, uh, we do need the clear, um, I call it not only a message, but position <laughs> clarity from the government, starting with CDC as to how this virus is spread uh, and the protections that are needed. We also need in the workplace an OSHA standard and President Biden uh, has issued an executive order uh, asking uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration to review the matter and to make a determination if a standard is needed needed and if there is a need for it, which we uh, who have been working, you know, representing workers uh, in this area firmly believe is needed, but they're supposed to do so by March 15th. So our hope is that, you know, within a month, uh, we will have an OSHA standard, which makes it very clear that there are very significant risks uh, and there are steps that employers, you know, not only should take, but are required to take. Thank you. Next question comes from Tina. Tina, uh, you might be unmuted if you'd like to ask your question. Uh, yes, uh, this is Tina Say from Science News Magazine. Uh, my question is, um, a lot of countries have taken to using carbon dioxide levels as a proxy for possible levels of the, the virus that you might encounter indoors. Is um, carbon dioxide um, monitoring part of your recommendations? And if not, uh, why not? Do you would you recommend that? Well, I I like to speak to this. Uh, I started promoting this idea that carbon dioxide was useful as an index of potential exposure um, twenty years ago, and uh, it has its place because. If you, if you think about it, the carbon dioxide in indoor environments is coming from the people in the environment and it's being taken away by ventilation. 
when the air in the indoor environment is replaced with air from outdoors. And to the extent that you don't have filtration and other things going on in the environment, it can give you an idea of what the balance of ventilation is. And so if you're in a place that has very high carbon dioxide levels, it means that the, the, the ventilation balance is off and there's potentially increased risk. But today, because a lot of places are putting in more filtration, uh, that may be less useful. Uh, but in places like homes or other places where you may not have filtration, it's certainly a first place to start. The other thing you have to be careful of is just because you have low levels of carbon dioxide or because you have filtration going on and generally reducing the concentration in the general vicinity, it doesn't mean you can get up close to somebody else who might be a source uh, because if you are breathing the plume of concentrated breath coming from them. Think about it as if they were smoking and they were puffing cigarette smoke out. If you're in the plume, you're still exposed. And it's still a matter of how concentrated is it and how long are you breathing it that drives the risk. Folks, clearly we can speak about these issues for much longer, and I do hope that we do, but uh, I would now like to thank all of the panelists for their time, all the signatories to the letter. So uh, a virtual round of applause as you were to everyone. And thanks so much to everyone for attending. Uh, that's all the time we have for today. Please note that the letter's signatories will continue to be available for interviews, so we encourage you to contact them. A list of press contacts will be sent to all registrants for this event, and a recording will also be made available shortly. Thanks again to everyone for joining. Have a safe and healthy rest of your day. Are you prepared to go back to work safely? Backtoworksafely.org features easy to follow, industry specific, science based recommendations for limiting the spread of the coronavirus when operating a wide variety of businesses. Download your free guidelines today at backtoworksafely.org.